in keeping with my desire to preach the most important things I can think of to you in my short time here, today I picked a topic that I think most of you probably hadn't heard a lot about, a lot of sermons about anyway, and that is revival. As we said earlier, re the word revival is not used in the Bible, but uh, in many passages, God, the people of God says to God, revive us again, and God says, I will revive my people. So the, the idea is there, revival is just the term for being revived. I've read probably every book uh, written on the subject, not everyone, but most of them, on the subject of revival. I've studied all the revivals in the past. I'm going to share some of that with you today. But I want you to understand about revival and, most importantly, our need for revival. Our need for revival personally, our need for revival as churches, our need for revival as a country. So in order to start there, we're going to look at the book of Acts. I'd like to look at Acts chapter 1. In interpreting the book of Acts, you have to ask and answer a few questions. In the book of Acts, you see all these amazing things happening. These, God is doing all these amazing things. 3,000 saved in one day. All these different things. Tongues of fire. People speaking languages of people that they don't even know. They've never even been to those countries. You have all these amazing things happen. And you have to ask the question, is this something that only happened one time? Uh, at the beginning of the organized church, of course, the church had been around ever since they've been a believer. But the organized church being established at Pentecost, is this something that only happened then or does it still happen? And I can testify to you that, yes, it does still happen. It happens around the world. It's happening today. It's happened in history. I'm going to share some of those things with you today. So the way you interpret the book of Acts, and it's kind of intimidating when you read the book of Acts because you have all these things that, are, that you see happening, and you don't see them today that much. And you say, why not? Why don't I see them today? Well, the answer is simple because we're not in a period of revival. This is a period of revival where God is reviving He's, he's creating, you see revival in history where God is renewing a church that is dead or he's starting a new church, like in Korea, the, the revival in 1906. He's starting a new church. So he's, he's starting the church in terms of the organization of the church, and this power is released. But that's not the only time it's happened. It's happened many times in history. It's happening today. I'm going to tell you about some of those things. So the books of, book of Acts tells about the history of the organized church. It begins at Pentecost, which is 50 days after Jesus' resurrection. So Jesus rose from the grave, spent three days in the grave, then he stayed on earth for 40 years, I mean 40 days, uh, talking to people, and 500 at one time, people met with him in his spiritual, physical state, and then he ascended. And when he ascended, he said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit shall come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. He also said, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And teach you and observe all I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even at the end of the age. But the, but the apostles, after these 43 days, after Jesus' resurrection, they did not 
go out and start making disciples immediately. They did not go out witnessing. They went into an upper room and they prayed for seven days. Seven days they prayed in this upper room. And then the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. One definition of revival is when God pours out the Holy Spirit upon a place with power and miraculous events so that amazing things begin to happen. This is what we see in the book of Acts. So let's read a couple, couple of these passages. Uh, Acts chapter 1, verses 13, we can see them in the upper room. And when they entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they, had, they were staying. That is Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew and James the son of Aphasius and, and Simon the Zealot and Judas the son of James. These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer. Along with the women, Mary and the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. So his brothers, his mother... Women, the women that followed him around, his disciples, all prayed for seven days. And there were about, a, verse 15 says, there were about 120 people in the room. 120 people praying for seven days. I assume continuously, 24 hours a day, for seven days. And then came the fulfillment. And we're told in the Bible that this is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel. This is chapter 2, verse 14. Verse 14 in chapter 2. And Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, men of Judas and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour. But this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel, it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, for your sons and your daughters will shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in these days pour forth my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will grant wonders in the sky above, and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So what happened when the Holy Spirit came? This is chapter 2, verse, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in that place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they appeared to them tongues of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues that the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now, there were Jews living in the Jerusalem, devout men, from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in their own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Why are not all these who are speaking from Galilee? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Pergia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the district of Libya and Cyrene, and the visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they, are, they all continue in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking him, say they, they were full, they were drunk, they were full of wine. So they, they had all these things happen these miraculous things, they spoke in languages they did not know. And people heard them in their own language, even though they did not know the language, even though the speakers did not know the language. So what happened after this? This is chapter 2, verse 14. 
I'm sorry, I already read it. Chapter 2, verse 37. All right, these are the results of what happened when the Spirit fell upon the church at Pentecost. Now, when they heard this, they heard Peter speak, and they had the Spirit was thick upon the place. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the disciples, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call unto himself. And with many other words, and solemn, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received the word were baptized, and there were added about 3,000 souls. And they were continuing devoting themselves to pray, the apostles' teaching, and to fellowship, and the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many signs and wonders were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing with them all as anyone might have need. Day and night, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding their number daily, those who were being saved. So the Holy Spirit fell. 3,000 people were saved. They had this great love for the teaching of the truth. They had great fellowship. They, they loved each other. There was a sense of awe and signs and wonders were occurring. And they had all things in common. And some people, even though this is not required, they went out and sold all their property and gave it to the poor. And day, to, day and night they were continually in the temple with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God. So amazing stuff happened at, at, in the book of Acts. Amazing stuff happened. These things were a revival period, in my opinion. This is where God is establishing his church, and he, sends it, he pours out his spirit upon the earth in an unusual way. Does he still do that today? Do we see things happening today like that? And if so, if not, why don't we see things like that today? Is it because we have become comfortable and are sinful? Or what is it that we, why we don't see these things coming today? I've always really felt uncomfortable about reading about revival in the book of Acts. Because we don't see these things happening most of the time today. Instead, most churches rarely see anybody become a Christian. I had a church one time in Pensacola where we had more people became Christians every year in our church than all 27 churches in our presbytery had combined. Well, it wasn't that we had that many. We had 35 or so a year, but um, they just didn't have any. We see strife and selfishness in the church, gossip and backbiting, power plays and unfairness. I had trouble relating to the idea of revival until I saw one. And I'm going to tell you about that today. I saw two. I've seen two. So what's wrong? Does the book of Acts tell us how it is supposed to be all the time? Or is, it, is this something different? Is this the way it's supposed to be all the time? Or is this something different? that we don't usually experience. I believe that revival is a sovereign work of God which he sends periodically to revive his church because his church is filled with sinful people and we are prone to lose our fire and zeal. He, so he sends revival because of us, because of our, 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 our comfortable feelings and because of our sin and he sends it because of sin in general he sends it because we're prone to wonder we're prone to become to lose our our first love to be comfortable and, and not have a commitment that we should have to the lord and to the great commission 
So he sees that and he sends revival to revive the church. We don't know when it's going to come. How does revival occur? It do, we don't know when it's going to come. It's a sovereign act of God. God gives it when he chooses. We see that throughout history. It happens at the most surprising times. Only God can give revival. It is something that cannot be scheduled. I always, I always chuckle when I go by a Baptist church and it says on the sign, revival next Wednesday. Well, you know, you can't, re, you can't schedule revival. We don't know when it's going to happen. You can't, just because, because you call a meeting revival, it doesn't mean it's going to be a revival. Only God can give revival. There's nothing we can do to make it happen. But there are some things we can do provide to provide an atmosphere where God is more likely to send it. Like the fervent prayer in the upper room, the confession of sins to one another, confess our sins to God and one another. We do that in earnestness of heart. That makes it more likely that God will send a revival. But I don't even think that when we do those things, it's because we are prompted to do it. I think God prompts us to it. I think that's the beginning of revival. When we see people starting to pray 24 hours a day and pray every day, when we see, when we see people confessing their known sins to God, that's God working in them to prepare the way for the revival. It's back to that idea we talked about the other day of sovereignty and responsibility. Uh, God is sovereign. He brings the revival when he chooses, but there are things we can do to meet conditions that have to be there for them to be met, uh, for him to come, to provide the atmosphere where it's more likely to happen. You see that in the verse, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, it says, who are called by my name will humble themselves, prerequisite, and pray, Seek my face. Turn from their wicked ways. Those are four things he says to do. He said, if you do those four things, I'll do three things. I will hear from heaven. I will forgive your sin, and I will heal your land. So it doesn't say all the non-believers have to do this. It says just the believers have to do it. If you, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves in praise, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. So, God solemnly brings revival when he chooses. But there are things we can do to meet the prerequisites. But then only God can decide when he is going to send a revival. So as I've studied revivals all over the world, throughout history, and, I, and I've read the book of Acts, I see certain things that always occur leading up to a revival or, or in the beginning stages of revival and during a revival. These things are always there. Let me, let me give you some things that are always in every one of them. There's always a seeking, a passionate seeking for God. And there's always lots of compulsive prayer. There's always confession of sin to God and confession of sin to one another. There's always a feeling of desperation, like things are not right and something needs to change. There's always a hunger for the truth. There's always signs and wonders that occur. There's always grieving over sin and emotional outbursts of weeping and other things. There's always cultural change. There's always great cultural change when the revival occurs. Things happen in the culture. There's always great preaching. There's always small groups where people meet like in the Wesleyan Revival, the class meetings. And there's always fervent evangelism and many of them describe the Spirit as being heavy or thick upon the place. Or it's, the Holy Spirit comes down heavy upon the place. So let me give you some examples that you might... I'm, I'm going to run through these quickly because I'm running out of time. We may go just a little late today if that's all right. <clears throat> All right, we have the book of Acts. We've seen what happened there. We see all the things that happened in the book of Acts. Well, the next great revival that's, that I know about that's recorded, there, there were others, but was the Reformation in the 1500s, Martin Luther. It was a re revival that really changed the whole state of Europe. People were hungry for the truth. They had been lied to by the Catholic Church. They had... 
Uh, they were hungry for the gospel. Uh, they were hungry for scripture to read. And this brought about a great revival in Europe, which created what's been called the Protestant church, which we are today. The Great Awakening is another one, 1734. It lasted for 40 years. Um, Christianity was on the wane in the colonies. This was before the Revolutionary War. Christianity was on the wane. Prosperity and peace had made people slack and complacent. The age of reason told them that spiritual things are not true. There was debauchery. And, even, and the churches that came in and started so well in the colonies were now teaching that personal salvation or conversion was not necessary, that you didn't have to be born again to be saved. Most of the pastors didn't even believe. William Tennant, the founder of the Law College, preached a sermon, famous sermon, the danger of the unconverted ministry. But then it happened. One day, Jonathan Edwards, who was a great theologian, probably the greatest theologian in American history, was a pastor of Northampton Church. And he was the kind of guy that just, just preached uh, written sermons. He wrote them and he read them out. I mean, he was a great theologian, but by all accounts, not a great preacher. But he started preaching one day. He started preaching one day, and the name of the sermon was Sinners in the Hands of the Angry God. Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. He started preaching... And all the people got terrified and got up and pressed their backs to the wall in the church. Pressed their backs to the wall. And he continued to preach, and they all were standing terrified against the wall. And, and later he asked them, why were you standing against the wall? He said, because we, we everybody together saw the, a hole open up in the floor of the church and appeared into hell. And they, they could see themselves dangling over the pit of hell and the only thing that was keeping them from falling into hell was the grace of God. And that was the beginning of the revival. It started in a Presbyterian church. In fact, four of the great revivals started in Presbyterian churches. Four of the great revivals. And they, that, that spread out all over the colonies. The 13 colonies were all transformed. Great preaching took place. A guy by the name of, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I've got, I've got it written down here. I know his name like, like my own. A senior moment. <clears throat> George Whitfield, that's it, George Whitfield. George Whitfield was a great preacher uh, in the colonies. He had a voice where he could preach to thousands. He preached to 20, over 20,000 outside without a microphone. In Philadelphia, there were 12,000 people in the town at that time, and when he preached in Philadelphia, there were 15,000 people who came. And he was a friend of Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin printed all of his sermons in his newspaper. And he preached throughout the colonies, and the colonies were transformed. This debauchery, this uh, complacency was changed. Thousands of people were saved during that 40-year period. Thousands of people changed. The culture was changed. In fact, it had a great impact upon our leaders. A lot of people don't know this, but Patrick Henry, his great statement he made, give me liberty or give me death. You've heard that before? Give me liberty or give me death. He took that from a sermon he heard during the Reformation. That wasn't original to him. He borrowed it. But he gets credit for it, of course. Give me liberty or give me death. Of course, there were excesses in this revival as there are in others. Jonathan Avers actually wrote a book about the excesses. He explains in the book, and I read his book, he explains that there's a difference between emotionalism and emotions. Emotionalism is when you base what you do on your emotions. Emotional, emotionalism is when you base what you do on your emotions. But Emotion, proper emotions is when you base what you do on truth. It's like the train of truth. You have the truth pulling the train. You have faith in the truth, and your emotions are, are, are triggered as a response to the truth. And Jonathan Edwards says, 
Whenever emotions have occurred, there were excesses, but as long as it, it was genuine emotion, genuine grief, genuine tears, it was fine. In fact, you can make a point from the Great Awakening that um, there would be, have been no Revolutionary War without the Great Awakening. It took place the 40 years preceding the war. Most of the people that fought in the war and instigated the war and did everything to found our country, most of the people were influenced by the, by the Great Awakening. Many of them were saved by the Great Awakening. There probably wouldn't have been an American Revolution without the Great Awakening. Another one that I, that I found interesting was the, in the United States was the Laban Revival of 1857. This also took place out of a uh, Presbyterian church, a Dutch Reformed Presbyterian church in New York City. Uh, they had moved their church out into the um, <clears throat> suburbs uh, and they put a mission lay minister into that church. Nobody there, no, no members. So he tried everything to get people to come and they couldn't get anybody to come. So he said, why don't I pray? So he, he advertised he was going to have a prayer meeting every single day at lunch for businessmen. Every single day. One hour a day, every day. First day, he was the only one there. Second day, he had six. In three months, he had 15,000 people meeting prepared. 15,000. 15,000. Several other revivals came from this revival. It spread across the north. At one point, they estimated there were 800,000 people praying in, 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 in the United States because of this revival. This layman started prayer, and all they did was pray for one hour every day, and it just it exploded. It started on February 23, 1857. A week later, the stock market crashed. People were starving in the streets. There were no jobs. This sense of desperation that this is not what, the way it should be was there, and they, they were hungry. And they came. So New York was transformed. They estimated at the height of the revival, 20,000 people in New York were being saved per day. Overseas, it spread overseas and millions were saved. Let me talk a minute about the Korean revival. This is important because it was also started in the Presbyterian Church in Korea. Korea was a mostly Buddhist, Hindu country. The first Bibles came there in 1900. The man who brought them was a guy named Robert Germain Thomas around, around 1900 because he was distributing Bibles, he was beheaded and killed. In 1906, this is a very short time after the church really started there, the revival occurred. The man that beheaded Robert Germain Thomas became a Christian and confessed his sin in the church. They were having a meeting in one of the Presbyterian churches. They were all worried about not having any converts in, in, in Korea. And all of a sudden, one of the elders, one of the elders got up in the church and said, I stole money. He confessed. He confessed he stole money. And, um, and then somebody else got up and confessed. One of the missionaries got up and says, I, I look down on you, the people. And then one of the p people got up and said, I hate you, the missionaries. And everybody started confessing their sins to one another as they were praying. And this was the start of the great revival in Korea, where 30,000 people were saved in the first month. And now today, Korea has the is the largest percentage population Christian country in the, in the world. More people, more a greater percentage of people are Christians in Korea than any nation in the world. It has the four largest churches in the world. The largest being 100,000 members, with 10,000 small groups. Revival is still going on in Korea since 1906. They're even, we're even told that there is a vibrant church in North Korea. We don't we're not told about this, of about 300,000 people in North Korea, and they are in the severe, severe persecution in North Korea.
Well, I was going to tell you about the Western Revival in England, about the college revivals where revival uh, spread across college campuses, about the Jesus movement. I could tell you about a bunch of them, about, about the revival in 1906. But um, I'm going to tell you about two revivals I personally saw. Two revivals I personally saw. When I was in the ministry, the Berlin Wall fell. You remember that when the Berlin Wall fell? And, um, and I was asked to go and preach in Ukraine after the Berlin Wall fell. I took a singing group called New Day uh, with me, and they would do concerts, and I would preach with a translator. And we took 70,000 Bibles, 70,000 Bibles, because they couldn't get a Bible in Ukraine. This was right after communism fell, right after the wall fell. So we went with 70,000 Bibles. All of them disappeared the first day. All, we, locked, we gave away 70,000 Bibles the first day. We would, I would preach to huge crowds. New Day would sing. I would preach. Thousands would become Christian. Thousands. I mean, just, it was like, it didn't really matter what I said. You know, it didn't seem like it really mattered. They all became Christians. It was amazing. The, the head of the Soviet nuclear program became Christian. He prayed to receive Christ with me with tears in his eyes. I saw things there that I'd never seen before. I saw healings. I saw a man with a withered hand, his hand restored. I saw, I saw some amazing stuff when I was in. I saw a revival. And now I don't question that they can come because I've seen them. I've seen them. And then another one I saw was in Veramosa, Mexico. I went there by invitation to train laymen who were working in the churches. This is an unusual place, very much in Mexico. It's called Tabasco Province. Yes, it's Tabasco sauce. That's the same guy. Um, but it's the, only, it's the only province in Mexico that's not Catholic. A hundred years ago, a Catholic priest raped the governor's daughter, and they kicked all the Catholics out of the, out of the province. Now it's predominantly Presbyterian. When I went there, there were 700 Presbyterian churches in that little province and only three pastors. 700 churches and only three pastors. All the work was being done by laymen. I went there to train the laity to be able to do all this work that they needed to do because they didn't have any pastors. And it was amazing. There again, same thing. I would get up and preach with a translator and everybody in the room would become saved. Just about everybody. It was like it happened every time. Uh, you could start a church in a week. You, you just said, we're going to have a church here. We, you can call the place. And, it, and they would come. And it, you'd have 200 people the first week. 200 people in the church. I mean, people got saved right and left. The people were the, were the kindest, best people i ever see. Most of them didn't have cars. They walked everywhere. Their kids went with them. It was a 100 degree temperature. They had no air conditioning in the church. They sat there at their parents' feet quietly and listened to the word of God. They were so hungry, so, so fired up for God that it, you know, it was just an amazing place, amazing. But that was revival. That's what it looks like. I was talking to my daughter. Uh, she had a revival. In her, on her college campus last year. It started when two girls, Hannah and Destiny, had separate dreams about the same thing. They didn't know each other. They had separate dreams about the, and when they met each other, they found out they were having this dream about this place where they would have 24 hours of prayer. So they gathered some people together, told some people about it. 13 people started meeting every night for four hours and praying, four hours a night praying. One of them was my daughter. And they prayed for a couple of months, and then they had this meeting. They were going to meet in a certain room, but the, but the uh, college said, no, you can't have that room. and gave them another room. It was the exact room that they, had pre that they had dreamed about, exact room that both of them had dreamed about. And they prayed for 24 hours. They had all the same things that I've already mentioned. They had people confessing their sins. They had people restoring relationships. They had people getting saved. They had people getting healed. They had people, they had all the same kinds of things that we've talked about. And there are revivals going on as we speak in many places in the world today. I want to 
I don't care how late it is. I'm, I'm going to talk about this. I, I, this is important. Um, there are revivals going on as we speak in many places today. Iran has the fastest growing church in the world. I would, um, I would recommend that you watch a, a, a YouTube video called Sheep Among Wolves. It's about the Iranian church. Formerly, there was very few Muslims that ever became Christians. For years and years and years, almost no Muslim. My, my son worked, worked in Sarajevo for 10 years. Among Muslims, he had 10 people become Christians in 10 years. 10 people. Yet now, the, to this year and last year, there have been 12 million Muslims saved. 12 million. 12 million in the world that have been saved. And they're all, it's happening by revival. Muslims all over the world are having a dream of meeting Jesus dressed in white. When my daughter was in Turkey, she met a guy. She told me about it. He said for 23 days, Jesus appeared to him in his dream and sat with him in a garden and answered his questions about Christianity. On the 21st day, he became a Christian and the dream stopped. All of the world people are having dreams about Jesus dressed in white. In, in the Quran, it says, if someone appears to you in a dream in, in white, listen to him. So Jesus appears in white. There's a story about a girl who, in a hijab, in a, in a complete hijab, showing up at a Protestant church, asking for the pastor and saying, I saw Jesus, um, Jesus appeared to me in white and said, come and see you. And she became a Christian. In Iran, thousands are becoming Christians every day. In that film on uh, <clears throat> Sheep Among Wolves, it tells some stories. Jesus always appears to them in white, just like it said. A drug addict tells a story about how Jesus walked into his room and sat down and talked to him. He was dressed in white. A prostitute hanged herself. She's one, of the, she's one of the you know key figures in this church in Iran. She hanged herself and she jumped off the chair and Jesus caught her. Jesus caught her and saved her. And he was dressed in white. Thousands are being saved. It says in that film, I don't know how true it is, but I, I, I trust the film, that the mosques in Iran are empty. Nobody is going to the mosque in Iran. Everyone is turning to Jesus. It's amazing. It's an amazing place. Amazing things happen when, when, when revival comes. So I'd like to conclude by just saying revival always begins in the church with Christians and spreads out to society. Why can't it begin with us? Why can't it begin with me? I've always said it. Why can't it begin with me? Why can't it begin with you? Why can't it begin with us? It always begins in a church and it always spreads out to the culture. Why can't it begin here? We need to pray. We need to confess our sins. We need to get rid of our sins as a church. We need to seek the face of God. Chase hard after him. Restore damaged relationships. Get, get into small groups and pray. And stop quenching the Holy Spirit. I'm convinced that unless we have a revival, our country is done. Do you believe that? I don't think that we're going to make it unless we have a revival in this country, like a great awakening type of revival. That's what it's going to take. We need to be so desperate that we yearn for a revival because we know that's the only hope. That's the only hope we have. That is the only hope we have. I'm disturbed about our, our society. I'm disturbed about our country. And when, you're, when there's desperation and people are disturbed, what's called a holy dissatisfaction, that's a lot of times when a revival would come. So the Bible says there's going to be lots of revivals toward the end of time. 
There's going to be lots of revivals. It's going to increase. More and more revivals. The knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the water covers the sea. Why is it going to be more? Because there's going to be persecution and desperation as a norm. And the church will be purified. The bride of Christ will magnify our witness and the cause of Christ. And the church will explode. The church is going to explode. There's going to be more and more revivals as the end, as the end of time draws near. So, my last, I have so many pieces of paper, I can't find what I'm talking about. 2 Corinthians 7.14 says, If my people who are called by my name will pray, that means continual, fervent prayer. Turn, seek my face. That means chase hard after God. Turn from their wicked ways. Confess your sins to, to God and to each other. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. My friends, we need to claim that promise. That it is not hopeless. It is not hopeless what's going on in this country. It is not hopeless. God can still revive us. So, we say, let's say with the psalmist, Lord, revive us again. Let's pray together. Lord, we come today and we thank you for this time together. Lord, as we pray about, as we, as we talk about revival, I pray that you would help us to want to see it happen, to plead with you to come and revive us again. Lord, we thank you for the fact that you're working now, even all over the world, in many, many places. Lord, revival is occurring now in Africa, in Asia, Indonesia. Lord, we pray that you will continue to do your work as you see fit. But if it so pleases you, Lord, please send revival to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.